Anybody raise hands? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I need to give you All right. Uh, Baptist bride teaching comes from Ephesians. And get uh, Ephesians chapter 4 in one hand. Ephesians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 3. Now, the Baptist bride teaching basically is this, that the local Baptist church is the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. And therefore, if you're not in the local Baptist church, you're not in the body of Christ, you're not in the bride of Christ. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, the first reference is uh, verse uh, 4 and 5. There's one body, one spirit, even your call and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The man's a Baptist bride, the one baptism is water baptism that puts him into the local Baptist church. The man is a Campbellite or a Church of Christ. The one baptism, of course, is water baptism that puts him into the Church of Christ. And the Campbellite has the advantage because he can say his name is scriptural and yours isn't because you can't find the word Baptist Church in the Bible. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, verse uh, 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So the Baptist bride position is you can be in the family without being in the body. You can be in the family without being in the bride. Now, right, one more verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. This is also postulated on the grounds that uh, the term church in the New Testament, and over a hundred times, maybe 117 times, at least 110 times, it is talking about a local church. So in the Baptist bride position, you recognize no church except the local church. And this does away with any church that's the body of Christ, other than a local church. Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, it said the church which is his body, and his body which is the church. So if you make the body of Christ the local church, then a local Baptist church is the only body of Christ there is. 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. this verse. For by one spirit are we all baptized to one body. Now, the two people that make that water baptism, one's a Baptist and one's a Church of Christ. And in order to get this thing to read right, they'll change the English and say, in one spirit. In order to say in one spirit, they do what you know they do. They run to the Greek. Whenever a fellow gets in trouble, he runs to the Greek. And he gets this in. Are you baptized and transliterate in? One spirit. By the way, all the charismatics have picked that up in the last three years. They used to talk about being baptized by the Holy Ghost, now they talk about the baptism in the Spirit, in the Spirit, in the Spirit. That's going to the Greek. And the fools don't know what they're talking about. We might know what they're talking about. They're all raised in these modern, dumb Christian colleges that teach a five-case Greek system, and there are eight cases. But your modern Christian educators in your school, like Bob Jones, Tennessee Temple, have become very stupid in the last 15, 20 years. They don't teach A.T. Robertson's eight-case Greek system. Now, in the five Greek system, you have this thing, you have a, a, a preposition in the market, or the preposition in the genitive, or the preposition in the baby, or the preposition in the student, or the preposition in the locker. Now, that's a preposition. Those so words like this, the full before, in, uh, in, in Greek, are prepositions. And in most languages, they occur in cases. And a case, you don't have it in English, but you have it in, you have it in German, other languages. And you get to study in German, you know, you get this uh, ending on a word, uh, uh, N, E, N, 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 E. That's the hardest thing in the world to learn in German is der, des, dem, dies, denen, daner. Those are case endings. And what they've done is, so this thing here, is, and this thing here, this end could be translated as a, as a N could be translated as N. And they're taking that thing here uh, just in a daily case. Now, in Robertson's case system, it's nominative, and then it's genitive, and then it's ablative. 
and then it's velocity, and then it's incremental, and then it's data, and then it's diffusion, and then it's, uh, well, I got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, velocity. That's one minute of velocity. That's an 8K system. That's normally generated after the lock of instrumental data to see his velocity. And these prepositions, when they're used, they can come in here. And that word end, as it stands, never means velocity, location. Never means end, translated in, unless it's talking about the location of a thing. That's why it's called velocity. So when you hit in in Greek, it is not translated as in unless it's talking about a location. The passage you read is the instrument by one sphere. You see? That's the instrumental case. So what you have is you have your Christian colleges have let a whole nation right into the pit with a bunch of dumb, stupid, ignorant, fifth grade Greek. That's what's going on. Amen, 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 and amen. All right, now, taking the past as it stands, I'm going to read like a Baptist writer. 12.13, For in one spirit, one frame of mind, one attitude, are we all water immersed into the local Baptist church? <laughs> but that can't be anything but the Holy Spirit, because look at the passage. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 3. That's the Holy Spirit. That isn't one spirit in the sense of... Uh, you're all in one spirit, you know, have the right spirit about a thing. That's the Holy Spirit. Oh, and our Baptist bride teaching is this. Here's a local Baptist church here. This is the body of Christ. How do you get into this body? By water baptism. By one spirit, you baptize the one body. Therefore, a Baptist bride, if you joined his church, you'd have to get rebaptized. Because his church is another body, and you left one body and got in that body. Now, somebody has lost a marble somewhere in the transaction. For example, for example, suppose a letter came to, to, uh, to Los Angeles. And the letter came here and said, uh, to the church at Los Angeles. Paul an apostle to the church at Los Angeles. Who would get the letter? Now, do you ever think about that? I mean, Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus, Colossians, to the church at Colossia, it's the local church. It is. All right, to the church at Los Angeles. Come on, folks, who gets the letter? Oh, no, the Catholics get it. They're the ones who church. <laughs> oh, sure, man. Sure, man. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And about the time he did that, the Campbellites say, Well, you bloody liars, we're the church of Christ. The word Catholic's not even in the Bible. We get it. And about the time they get it, the Baptists say, Oh, no, man, you water dogs, you Campbellites, you're heretics. We get it. You Baptist, how could you get it? Which Baptist church would get it? The Southern Baptist Church? Oh, no, no. The heretics. Well, uh, a missionary Baptist church? Uh, oh, 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 no, no, the free world Baptist church. No, no, no. The hard shell Baptist church. No, no, no. The Northern Baptist. No, the German Baptist. No, no. Uh, the conservative Baptist. No, no. It's the American Baptist. No, it's the. Oh, shut up. No Baptist church gets that letter. That's stupid. I my but the independents couldn't decide who did it. Who would get it? Was it the Brother Gilbert's church or Brother Anderson's church or somebody else's church over here? Now listen. First Corinthians twelve. There is one body. See that thing right there? Verse nineteen, verse sixteen, verse fourteen. There is one body. There is not one local church. So whatever it is, the body is not the local church. Otherwise you've got bodies. You've got corpses. Uh, uh, Noel Smith, the Bible Baptist Tribune, right before he died, was on that kick. The Lord took him home, fortunately. But Noel Smith in the Baptist Bible Tribune back uh, oh, 20 years ago, and even 15 years ago, I guess maybe 17 years ago, that fellow writing articles the fact that each local church is a body of Christ. There isn't any such thing as a body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church, and the church is the body of Christ. Now, that can only mean one thing. That means it's the Holy Spirit that puts you into Jesus Christ. By one Spirit, you baptize the one body, and it's one Spirit that puts you into Jesus Christ's body, and that body is a spiritual body. Now, the local church, I believe in the local church. And of the 117 times the local church is 
uh, church word church is mentioned in the New Testament, at least 110, it is the local church. I mean, tidings came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem, to the church at Ephesus right, to the church at so-and-so right, and the church at Laodicea right. I stand at the lo that's a local church in that place, see? So there is a local church. Now, what are the differences? All right, number one, you cannot have uh, the body of Christ himself made of unsaved people. But you can have unsaved people in a local church. Now, who doesn't know that? Is anybody going to say that every local Baptist church in America is composed of only saved people? The first local church Jesus Christ set up had a devil for a treasurer. Now, why would you call that the body of Christ? You know what's wrong? you got a bunch of lunatics in this country. I mean, we're it and nobody but us. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing what you are. Now, I can understand why pastors tend that way. Pastors get sick and tired of these universal body of Christ people floating around the country and getting in this truck swindle, sharing, coping, John MacArthur, Looney Tune stuff, and just blowing the money down a rat hole with no concern for souls, no burden for missionaries, no desire to study the Word of God, no meeting and assembling, and they get tired of vagabonds and church tramps just floating all over the country. So they develop this doctrine to nail that Christian down to a local church. Well, that's okay, but it's never right to do wrong, get a chance to do right. So you can't pervert the Bible just because you've got a bunch of sorry Christians. <laughs> All right, now there's some other things about that thing. When the Lord comes to rapture and calls out his body, which is his bride, he is not going to call out all the members of the local Baptist church because some of them aren't saved. That thing isn't going to work. And that isn't all. If the Baptist church is the bride of Christ, then at the marriage, here's Christ at the table with the bride, and here are the other people waiting on the tables. Now, can you imagine Harry Truman? He's a Baptist. And Martin Luther King, Jr., he's a Baptist, sitting at the table, and John Wesley and Martin Luther waiting on them. You're out of your mind. You've got one oar in the water. Your screws are loose. You say, the Pacific Coast Baptist College, there are a lot of devils these days making a good buck off a sucker. And that goes for a lot of places. I mean, you ever stop to think how peculiar it is when Ruckman comes around and body heads for the bushes? Isn't Biola located here somewhere? But where's the faculty? I've come to Fort Worth and Dallas, Texas 15 times in 40 years. I never saw any funny modeling the BBC in there one time or the Dallas Theological Seminary. I go up to the Carlisle Church every year along about October and advertise the paper three weeks. We'll pay any college professors round trip ticket here and room and board while he's here to talk to Brother Ruckman about the King James Bible. They don't show up. Lee Robertson sitting right down in the country in the west, Bob Jones sitting right down in the south, and Piedmont sitting right up there 60 miles away. Something's wrong. I think it's wrong in these colleges and places. They're taking that young fella and they're deceiving him about this thing. Now listen, Baptist bride, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Baptist bride, what a thing, man. What a thing. What an unholy, ungodly mess. Ephesians 5, verse 30. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. What do you do? Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the local Baptist assembly. Why, that's nonsense. Christ didn't just die for the local Baptist assembly. Christ died for every saved person in the face of this earth. So there two concepts here, and I believe in both of them. I'm a Baptist. I mean, folks say, well, you're not much of a Baptist. Listen, the hyper-dispensationalists, I'm so Baptistic for them, they can't stand me. I mean, I'm right in the middle. I got all the Brian and the Stamites and the O'Hareites and the Bullingerites cussing me out for being a Baptist, and I got all the Baptists cussing me out for being a dispensationalist. So I know I'm in the right place. <laughs> if, that's right, brother. If you're in the middle, they're both cussing you. If not both cussing you, you're off balance. 
Now, I believe in a local Baptist church. You couldn't join my church if you hadn't been immersed in water after you were saved. I wouldn't take you as a member. Now, if you got immersed in water after you were saved, I'd take you as a member on two conditions. Number one, that you knew that water had nothing to do with your salvation. And number two, that you were immersed in water after you trusted Christ. I'd accept that baptism. I wouldn't accept any other baptism. I wouldn't take a fellow just because he'd been baptized. If you got baptized before you were saved, that won't do. Because water baptism is a figure of your salvation. If you weren't saved, you have the figure without the substance. And again, if you were a Campbellite, I wouldn't take you in my church in your baptism because you might still think it had something to do with your salvation. Just trying to think about this. Baptists, the only people in the world, have the right slant on water baptism because they don't believe in it. <laughs> if you think about that, we're the only people that believe that water hadn't got nothing to do with it. If you had a Methodist handbook, John Wesley says, Acts 2.38. If you had Luther's smaller catechism, Acts 2.38. If you had a Church of Christ book, Acts 2.38. If you had an Episcopalian Anglican articles, Church of England, Acts 2.38. If you had a Heidelberg catechism or Westminster for the Presbyterian, Acts 2.38. And if you got a Roman Catholic missile, Acts 2.38. We don't believe in Acts 2.38. We, we don't believe water puts you into nothing except the city water system. I teach my people, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of water is water. <laughs> of those born of water, three are born outright, a mosquito, a, camel, a, mosquito, a tadpole, and a camelite. <laughs> and so the answer to that question is, the local Baptist church is not the bride of Christ. It's not the body of Christ. The local Baptist church is a church. It's a call-out assembly. And to call-out assembly and practice of water baptism is a figure of salvation because every major Christian in the New Testament was baptized in water, including Paul. And he said, follow me, so we follow him. All right, yes, sir. It would depend on how much emphasis you put on it. And I'll show and I'll show you why. Acts chapter one, Hebrews chapter ten. You're gonna to have to put some emphasis on it. But you're really gonna make a mess. Well, that's where I'm turning right now, the word of God. Acts chapter one, Hebrews chapter ten. Well, Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, here this bunch is meeting here. Acts chapter one, verse thirteen. And when they were come, they went to an upper room where abode Peter and Jane and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continue with one accord. They're meeting and they're meeting regularly in prayer and supplication. Fifteen, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names, they've got some kind of a record here, the number, the names, they got the names, they got the number of them. The number of the names together were about 120. Now, there's some kind of way of keeping track of who you got there, and that bunch is meet together, and they know how many of them there are. It was about 120. On right, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. And this is an admonition, right, uh, talking about toward the end of things, about the time the Lord getting ready to come. And this is a warning in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So Christians should get together. They should know who is there, their names, and know about how many of them are there, and they shouldn't forsake that assembly. Now, one more, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And Acts chapter 20, uh, verse... Uh, Seven. Now, an overemphasis in membership would uh, it would uh, cause a little bit of carnality and things. 
but there should be some kind of plan to meet together, to assemble together, to know who's there and know how many are there. Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse uh, uh, 7. And upon the first day of the week, now underline this, when the disciples came together to break bread, but there was a regular time those folks met, and that day is the first day of the week. And they came there not to celebrate the Mass. You'll find that thing is house to house and early in the book of Acts. Paul preached unto them. So there was preaching going on the first day of the week, and that bunch of assembling on the first day of the week. And another place in First Corinthians chapter 16, he talks about taking up the collection the first day of the week. And he talks about the thing having the stuff ready so there'll be no gatherings when he comes. And the idea is, you say, I'm going around and pick up this off of these missionaries. When I come to your assembly there, I want the stuff ready-made to pick it up so I don't go to this fellow and pick it up here, and that fellow there and pick it up there, and that fellow pick it up here. So there has to be some arrangements for getting together and meeting together and collecting together and praying together and assembling together with the names and the number of the names. And if church membership doesn't go beyond that, then it's scriptural member. It's scriptural. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. You have. When you come to mind, you come to mind, you get straightened out quick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately. You mean, you mean you supported false doctrines because you like the place? <laughs> All right. Oh, I turn to Hebrews chapter 12, or Hebrews, Hebrews 13, I'm not through with it yet. <laughs> Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, 1 Timothy 5. Now, what he says is so, what he says is so, but I want to show you now the danger of getting the loose, free thing, where you just do what you want to do and go where you feel comfortable, and then if you don't feel comfortable, you get out. I want to show you the danger in that. It, yeah, I'm going to show it to you. Then we want to get it out of here. Hebrews chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 5. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Paul's instruction to the local church. Let the elders that rule well. Now notice the expression, rule. R-U-L-E. That's a Pauline epistle, late in the... That's after the book of Acts, over. Let the elders that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now that thing talks about a rule, and that thing is there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. And the context is talking about giving. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. That communicate is like Galatians. Let him that is taught in the word communicate to him that teaches in all good things. Paul says, when I was going to the Philippians, no man communicated with me in regard to giving except you only. All right, verse in the passage of verse 16, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now here's the problem. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. That's a spiritual rule. That is a political rule. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves for the watch for your souls, 
are they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So the thing there where in America, where everybody is the land of the free and the home of the careless, <laughs> they can get, uh, everybody just get run around loose and not in subjection or submitting to anybody, and least of all a pastor of a local church. And if you know a fellow who loves the Lord and believes the book and is trying to teach and preach the book, you would do well to submit yourself to his authority. And for some of God's people, that's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do, especially when you get very advanced in the Scripture. After a while, you get thinking that you can't find a preacher who can feed you because you know so much more than he knows. I have that problem my tapes. There are people who buy my tapes and just gobble them up all over this country, and they just sit around and listen to tapes and listen to tapes and listen to tapes. Now, after a while, they know so much about the Bible, no preacher can do anything with them because he's not as smart as Brother Ruckman, you know. And if Brother Ruckman here, I'd listen to him, and whether you would or not. Uh, not everybody in my town listens to me, I'll guarantee you. And I'll tell you something else. If you, all you do is sit around and listen to tapes and listen to tapes and study and study and study, you will never get a proper concept of biblical Christianity. If you want to get a concept of biblical Christianity, I can tell you what to do. Because I do it. I do it. You get funny ideas about them. I don't know where they get them from. I mean, I don't give them to them. You know, heard me stand up and act like I was God, going to rise three days from the dead after I got buried. I mean, folks are all populist, worship Brother Ruckman, Ruckman, Ruck thinks he's this, thinks he's that. You never heard me put that impression on them. If they got that impression, they got it. No, I always do just enough crazy, stupid stuff so nobody get funny ideas about me. But they get them. And they get this idea, oh, Ruckman does just study, 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 doctrine, 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 doctrine. Now listen, now listen. I fish with a mullet net at night in the bayous. I till a garden on my bare feet. I fix busted commodes and haul rocks for driveways out in the yard and cut wood for the fireplace. I go to the jail and go back in the room with the guy and sit down there with him trying to get him straightened out in the scripture. I go to the jail and sometimes preach him through the bars. I go to the hospital and go with a dime and deal with him and go back in the burn wards and deal with him. Go door to door and knock on a guy, and three weeks later I have to run the guy down and catch him again when he's on shift work at night to try to get him while he's home. And you are never going to learn how to become a minister just sitting around listening to stuff. You're going to have to get out, you're going to have to deal with the people. So there's a danger there. I thought I'd get to the place where he just, you know, studies the Bible his own and then goes around looking for somebody who's smarter than he is who can show him something more than what he already knows. <laughs> and, brother, you'll get unbalanced. I'll, I'll go out in the preach on the street and yell at him. Now, do you think I talk about the lockety Dave accused about in the street? Folks, I want to tell you the, the accent here is the Ultima. This is the grave accent instead of the circumflex accent on the Ultima where the Epsilon contract verb uses the Yoda sub... Oh, man. You get out there and say, No hope in the Pope, Turner, Burn, Roman slaves, Jesus saves. See? Now, you're going to be of service for the Lord. You're going to have to do something besides just, you know, <laughs> write it by the word. One more, and then we'll have to get somebody else. So have I. I've been, I've been, I've preached them. i preached them. You know. I think what you say is just wonderful if it worked. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? Now listen. Scripture. Let each esteem the other better than himself. Have you ever been in a church like that? <laughs> I have been in 400 churches, and I have never seen a church like that. Yes, sir. 1439, all right. 
All right, the two things, the two statements made here, and they're both clear. The first one is, if you want to covet something, don't covet tongues. The first one, if you want to covet something, covet prophecy instead of tongues. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. Now, that's amplified earlier in the chapter. For example, come back to ch in chapter 14 earlier and look what he said about it. 14.2, or 14.1. Matter of fact, that's how the chapter began. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. There's just something you to covet. Desire spiritual gifts. But, rather, what for? That you may prophesy. So that's the desirable gift. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to men but to God, for no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks to men to edification, exhortation, comfort. So it's better. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. A little selfishness in that. But he that prophesies edifies the whole church. That's how he began that thing. And he winds up in verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. That if you want to, if you really want a gift, then learn how to talk to people and edify them and build them up in the faith and talk about the future, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy, and help them out and exhort them to live for God. And forbid not to speak with tongues. So you're not to say, all right, nobody can speak in tongues, and that's that. You're not to forbid it. If a man speaks with tongues and speaks scripture, you're not to shut him up and tell him he can't do it. But of course, there, there are rules in this chapter about it. For example, look at verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue. All right, the first rule is no women speak in tongues. You sure to get that from verse 34. Look at it. Now look at it. Now some of you Californians better read this stuff. You're in, the, you're in fantasy land where anything goes. You're in the great brown Disney world where, where you're liable to hear anything. Now, in 34, let your women keep silence for churches. All right, verse 27. If any man is speaking in unknown tongue, let it be by two or by three at the most. If you're in a church where women talk in tongues, you're in the wrong place. And if you're in a church where more than three men talk in tongues, you're in the wrong place. And that, by course, they can't do it more. They have to do one at a time to do it. And let one interpret. Oh, I know here the rules. No women. Only men, only three men, three men in order, and an interpreter present when they talk. Now, if that happens, let them talk. And if that don't happen, then it's the Lord ain't in it. Or oh, it's something else. Yes, sir. Matthew 11. All right. Matthew 11, verse 12. About this taking the kingdom. All right. And from the days of John the Baptist, and John comes in before Christ does, but not much before he does, and baptizes. The days of John the Baptist, Christ says the law and the prophets are until John, in Luke 16. From the days of John the Baptist until now, in the middle of Christ's ministry, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it before us. Now, the common teaching in this thing is that uh, you kind of get to heaven by working the fighting for it, and you get your salvation by taking the kingdom by force, in the sense of forcing your way into it. And of course, some tell you that isn't quite right. All right, now in the, in the passage, first of all, notice this question. The kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven, like the Bible, every time you find that kingdom of heaven, that is always talking about an earthly, literal, physical, visible kingdom. And the reason why people don't believe that is once you say earthly, if somebody says, well, that's heavenly, it isn't heavenly, it's heavenly. Now, that's where folks have a problem. You see, heaven, there's nothing spiritual about heaven. So I'm probably talking about dying going on to heaven, you keep thinking of a spiritual condition. Why, you don't even go to a spiritual condition when you die. Your home is New Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. Not up your spiritual either case.
Here's a man that says, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same. They keep fighting all the schools. Uh-huh. Yeah. Caught on a dumpster. Why, if you teach fighting the same in all schools, you know what you taught? You taught pantheism. The idea of saying God and heaven are the same word. The very idea. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. They're not the same. But if a, if a professor can't understand it, he figures it's a heresy. That's how they are. They figure if they can't understand a passage, then there's something wrong with the passage. Or if you, you only can't understand these teachings, then you're a heretic. It's not down to you. Now, see that? Birds fly in heaven. God, birds don't fly in God. You take a root. Well, you take a rock up to heaven, you can't take a rock from the God. The sun rises every morning in the east and the heaven sets in the west, and uh, it doesn't rise in God and set in God. And the heavens and earth will melt with a fervent heat, and God isn't about to melt with anything. Yeah. So to say to the same is nonsense. Well, if that thing right there is a kingdom, that's the kingdom that's promised the people on this earth. And the Jew has promised that kingdom. Acts chapter 1, love about this time, restore the kingdom of Israel. The Lord God shall give birth to this boy is going to be born, and the way he should be great in the sight of the Lord God, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, and in peace of his government, there shall be no end. So in this passage here where he says, the days have gone to Baptist, and for now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Here's John coming to there and reporting, and he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. So if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then it all showed up when Christ showed up. Because when old John steps out there, he says, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it don't show up. What's the problem? Verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied with John. The Jew hadn't got that kingdom. Somebody's taken that kingdom from them by force, and somebody's got it. And when John the Baptist shows up, they still got it. Turn to Luke chapter 1, let's see who's got it. And when Jesus Christ was born, uh, Jews were going to get that kingdom back. And they didn't get it back. Luke chapter 1, the violent got it by force. We'll take, uh, oh, Luke chapter 1, oh, Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 67. This is a prophecy on John the Baptist. Luke 1, 67. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Now watch this. That we should be saved from our enemies. Who's that? Verse 63. His name is John. His name is John. Verse 72, to perform the mercy, so forth and so on. 74, that he would grant to us we'd be delivered out of the hand of our enemies. See that thing right there? Now he's talking about their deliverance for that nation. For that nation. Verse 79, to give light to them that are sitting, so forth and so on. The way of peace. So when John shows up, he says it's a hand, and it doesn't show up, and Christ says until now, up to now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. You know who had the kingdom right then? Rome had the kingdom. And when Rome had the kingdom, and he put Jesus up there and said, Behold your king, that bunch hollered, and said, We have no king but Caesar, but Caesar. That's the best interpretation of the passage. Yes, sir. Luke. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly, that's about John again, isn't it? All right, then in that case, you've got to apply the other one. In John chapter 16, verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and the violent don't take it by force. They press into it. See, you change that book? They're not the same. That's a spiritual kingdom. You can press into that one, but you can't take it by violence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I get Second John on one hand, get Galatians chapter one on the other. 
Galatians chapter 1, the second John. Okay, I got the question. All right, second John. Now, the first thing I ask that question is second John has nothing to do with anybody teaching salvation by grace and works or being kept for salvation by grace through works. Second John, beginning at verse uh, 8, has to do with you supporting an unsaved liberal. Look at Second John chapter 8. Look to yourselves. We lose not those things which we have wrought. We receive a full reward. Whoever transgressions abide not the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? Verse 7. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That is talking about supporting somebody who denies the deity of Christ. And John Wesley never denied the deity of Christ. And Bob Jones never denied the deity of Christ. Matter of fact, no Orthodox Methodist ever did. You take Peter Cartwright's a great Methodist preacher. He didn't, he didn't deny the deity of Christ. You take uh, Morris and Culpepper. They didn't deny the deity of Christ. Matter of fact, those old-time Methodist preachers, they, they magnified the deity of Christ. Nobody could accuse Sam Jones of denying the deity of Christ. So the passage there has nothing to do with that. Now the question comes up, since it is a false teaching, at least we Baptists believe it is. We believe it is, and I do, for this age. So you've got to watch that, too. I mean, somebody steps in there and says, well, uh, anybody who teaches you to lose your salvation, obviously, is just a raging heretic. Now just slow down, brother. Every denomination in the world except two believes you can lose it. The Presbyterian, the Baptists, are the only people that you can lose it. Now, how do you count for that? If it's such a wild, way out doctrine, how do you count for the fact that the Catholics believe it, the Lutherans believe it, the Methodists believe it, the Episcopalians believe it, the Church of God believe it, the Assembly of God believe it, the Pentecostals believe it, the Nazarene believe it, the Methodists believe it? How do you explain all that belief in a Christian losing his salvation if there's no basis for it? And the answer is, there's plenty of basis for it. Now, of course, me, I'm a Baptist. I don't uh, accept the basis applicable to us now. But come, come to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm Baptistic. I, I'm, I'm a much a Baptist. Baptist. You haven't met in your life, man. I don't believe you go to hell if you tried after you say. Now, that's strong enough for you? You want to be strong in that? All right, Galatians chapter 1. I believe that, but boy, I read that book. Let me tell you, man, I'm... I'm going through 117 times now up to, uh, I'm about, uh, Proverbs chapter, uh, Proverbs, I've gone to Ecclesiastes. I'm 117 times to Ecclesiastes 3. And let me tell you, beloved, there is verse after verse after verse after verse after verse in that book that would imply that somebody can lose salvation after they've got it. As a matter of fact, there are over 150. All right, Galatians chapter 1. Now, if John Wesley and Bob Jones Sr. preached another gospel uh, than what Paul preached, then, of course, they'd come under the ban of Second John, because we read here, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you that which you have received, let him be accursed. So the question is, that Bob Jones Sr. being a Methodist, or John Wesley being a Methodist, or Sam Jones being a Methodist, or um, Bob Schuler, and I'm not talking about Robert Schuler, <laughs> I'm talking about Bob Schuler. He used to have a great preacher in this town. In this town, he had one of the greatest preachers in the country. He's dead and gone now, but he preached at the Trinity uh, Methodist Church here in Los Angeles. His name is Bob Schuler. He's from West Virginia. They call him Fighting Bob. <laughs> And old Bob Schuler would give him a fit, boy. He'd give him a fit. He's an old-time Methodist. He had three sons, Phil, Bob, and Jack. And Jack's dead now. I think the other two are still preaching. And Bob Schuler was an old-time Methodist, and he preached the gospel. What is the gospel? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And if a Methodist is preaching this, he's not an unsaved man, even if he believes you can lose it. 1 Corinthians 15. I was, I'm not through with the question yet, brother. At Bob Jones University, one time we had two fellows up there preaching. One of his name was Bob Schuler, the Methodist, and the other was Jane McGinley, the Baptist. That was the most, one of the most interesting things you ever got to do in your life. And they got, you know, kidding each other on the platform like two speakers will do when they, when they share a platform. It gets, you know, real humorous after a while. And, uh, back in those days, Bob Jones had a lot of fire in it. Uh, you wouldn't have to take my word for that. All you'd have to do is get a, any tape made back there in the 50s 
with speakers and compare it with any tape that you heard made in the 70s, and you'd see something that's gone completely wrong with the congregation. Back in the 50s, there'd be a lot of laughter and some amens, and 2,000 students would just roar sometimes. You get the 70s, you hear this, <laughs> say something that's funny. <laughs> sick, man. I'm the sick of a hop sick and hippopotamus with chap lips, man. That's right. That's right. All right, first Corinthians fifteen three. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also receive, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's the gospel. Look at verse one. That is the gospel. And the Methodists, old time Methodists, all preach that. Every one of them. Matter of fact, John Wesley and, and, and Culpepper and Morrison and Peter Conright and those fellows, they preached that a man was saved by grace through faith. The only thing is, they taught if he didn't live careful, <laughs> he'd be liable to lose it. And I don't believe that. But they believe it. And sometimes you wonder, you know, the results they got were the results the Baptists got that maybe that was the right stuff to preach. Now, I'm not going to preach it. I'm going to preach eternal security. But they put the fear of God in you, boy. Oh. Oh. No, I sure didn't. No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, so I was just stating it just exactly like it should have been stated. Oh, that's something else. Yes, sir. Let's go back to the All right, I'll take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians, and we've got 1 Corinthians one hand, 1 John the other. 1 John 1, and 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 John 1. Now, these cases he's talking about here are very common things in America today. Very common, and more common by the minute. Your divorce rate in America now is better than one out of two. It's something like 53 percent. And all kinds of trouble, this women trouble and the sex trouble, it's ten times as bad as it was when I got in the ministry, and it'll be ten times worse in the next couple of years. And as a consequence, the problem comes up, what do you do in these situations? Now, on one hand, you've got a bunch of Protestant popes that say, so-and-so qualifies, and I hereby declare he qualifies, that puts him in, and if he don't qualify, and I say he don't qualify, he's out, you know. You get those kind of things. Now, you have this thing. You have this thing where if a fellow messes up, how much messing up should you put up with before he's disqualified? You have that. All right, now we'll take, first of all, a case of just a member in a local church, 1 Corinthians 5. Now, it's just a member. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly there is fornication among you, and such fornication as so not, not much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, there's a fellow going to bed with his father's wife. That's what Reuben does in Genesis. And that's what Goliath does. That's how Goliath gets four brothers that are his sons. And you won't find that in original Hebrew either. Matter of fact, that's why the, why the RV said the King James was wrong and put out an RV in 1881 because of that gross error in the King James. It wasn't a gross error. Now, you know the expression in the sports world for this. They have an expression. Now, out there, and you folks watch television and stuff, you ever see a fellow saying, these comedians on TV at night, you mother, you mother, you mother, that ain't the whole expression. The whole expression right there, First Corinthians chapter 5. And the Bible always be a little bit plainer than the uh, hypocrites are. Oh, now, that fellow there, you've got, to, you've got to admit that was a terrible sin. Certainly worse than adultery. Now, what happened to that fellow? All right, First John chapter 1. Now, here's the first principle. The first principle is, and we won't talk about him being a preacher yet, although we'll talk about that in a minute. But the first principle is, on an individual basis, this is the Scripture. 
uh, for any individual, preacher or not. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, one, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, two. All right, verse 7. If we have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from what? 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 Again. Louder. That means all. See, in the Greek, in the Greek, <laughs> that word is very emphatic. It means A-L-L, -L, see? And that means everything. The thing is, some of God's people think it means all the sins except the ones that, that I commit, or all the sins except the ones I don't commit, see? Now, that's everything. So as far as forgiveness and cleansing goes, that's complete. Now, let's see how complete it is. Come to 2 Corinthians 2, we'll take the case of this brother who is messing with his father's wife. 2 Corinthians 2, and you get into these things. I was telling, talking to the brethren this morning about writing a book, you know, which is a stupid thing for me to say. I've written 69 of them, but I may write another one in any minute. <laughs> I, just, I just finished one on how to teach the Bible. I just finished an autobiography, and I started now on the Psalms. So I'm still running the 800 pages someplace. But someday I'll just write a book of the messes I've run into in the ministry with preachers. <laughs> I've never written a book on that. And boy, you get in some messes, man. I'm telling you, you wouldn't believe it. I had a meeting over to San Diego for a couple of years back, and two guys met me outside the church, and he said, You can handle any question in the Bible in five seconds, can you? I said, Well, maybe, maybe not. I'll try it. And he said, okay. He said, what if you go to a church where the pastor is molesting your little girl? And he said, what would you do? Oh, you know, chapter and verse, man. And I said, well, if I was that kind of a case, I said, uh, what are your alternatives? He said, well, would you turn him in? Would you face him, with, with, uh, with, face him about it or what? I said, well, I said, I'd go to him. I'd take my little girl with me and my wife, and I'd sit down and talk with him. And I said, if I found my little girl was lying, I'd beat her britches. See, I mean, you know, the kids, they put it on, too, you know, sometimes. And I said, if I thought after talking in for half an hour he was lying, I said, I'd get out and I'd never go back here again. And he said, would you make the thing public? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, you'd mess up your little girl. And you'd probably mess up a lot of more Christians, a lot of more people get messed up that shouldn't get messed up. And he said, yeah, but what if you were in a state where it was a criminal offense not to report or something like that if you knew it? Romans 13, 1 to 3. So he turned it in. And the guy, the guy made accounts and put him in San Quentin. And uh, kind of funny aftermath, you know. See, I'm acquainted with these things. They don't shock me in. They shock you. Boy, boys and girls, let me tell you, I am shock proof. You would have, <laughs> you would have a time shocking me with anything, man. I mean, anything, brother. I mean, if you, if you bought me a guy and he stood right from me and turned inside out and turned to a three-headed dragon, I'd say, well, that's interesting, you know. <laughs> you, know <laughs> you know, if you think you can <laughs> do that act in public, we'll charge admission for it. <laughs> and so this guy, this fellow was a Bible-believing man and a soul winner. And he got off to jail, and he hadn't been in jail four months. I got a letter from a color fellow in jail, San Quentin. He, Dr. Rook, that one of your friends is in here. <laughs> he said, he led me to Christ, and he said, I'm saved, now. I want to learn the Bible. He said, the best way to learn the Bible is to write to you, so I want some Bible stuff from you. So I started helping him out. And about four months later, I picked up a paper, and here it said, Charles Manson, San Quentin, almost died today in a, in a, in a fight. Somebody stoked him in... A uh, cigarette lighter fluid and set fire to him. He got th third degree burns, and it said it was over some religious discussion. <laughs> got him, got him, got him. I said, My boy got him, man. He got him. <laughs> now, 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 you know something? That shows you a strange thing. There's a preacher who fell in a terrible mess and committed a horrible sin, and he paid for it. I'm sure he's paying for it. He'll pay for it the rest of his life, man. You think what that did to his family, his wife and kids, man? That's rough. But he witnessed it. And I, 
That ain't the time to raise the hand, brother, unless you're a witness. The thing is this, are some of you, are you folks witnessing? You clean folks? All right, Second Corinthians chapter 2, every head bowed, every eye shut. You know, let's stand and sing, have that on way, Lord, have that on way. <laughs> well, you know, one time, I'll get back to the minute, I was, I, was coming, I was coming down to Texas, and I came down there, and a guy picked me up in the car and took me to church. On the way to the church, he gave me a clipping, and here was a preacher who'd been with, him, been with him the summer before in jail, him and his wife. And uh, he said, you remember that fellow that was singing to you last year? And his wife played the piano? I said, yeah. He said, he's in jail. He said, what for? I said, resisting arrest and trying to beat up the police. I said, what come? How come? He said, they came to arrest his wife. I said, what they arresting his wife for? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, these days, if San Antonio was in this shape, I can imagine the state of L.A. then. I mean, this thing here was an independent, premillennial, Bible-believing Baptist church, and the woman had a prostitution ring. And, and, the, and the choir were the call girls, and she was the madam, <laughs> and she was the pastor's wife. Now, let me tell you something. Those are Bible-believing, premillennial, fundamental people. Now, if that stuff's going on, you can imagine the shape the Episcopalians are in. <laughs> All right, Second Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Now, look at, verse, look at verse 4. Now, this is what Paul writes about that fellow shacking up with his father's wife. Look at this. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I might overcharge you all. Now look at this. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with much over much sorrow. The fellow is to be forgiven and restored even after that, and to comfort him. Now the problem comes up, though, when you come to a preacher. Now I'll show you why. Turn to First Timothy chapter 3. A preacher has some ideal qualifications laid down here for him. And of course we all know that no preacher meets all of them. These are ideal. Now as you get a man to come the closest you can, let me tell you something. If every man was put out of the pastorate that didn't meet these qualifications, I don't know who would be left pastoring in America. I've been in 400 Baptist churches and acquainted with at least uh, 600 Baptist preachers directly and indirectly. I never met a man in my life. Well, I said I've met a man in life. I think I've met about five. I think about, I know about five men that will fulfill everything in this passage. And five is a mighty small handful out of 600 men. All right, three one. This is a true saying: If a man desire the office of bishop, he desires a good work. First qualification: A bishop then must be blameless. Well, there they go. <laughs> That's the end of them. <laughs> All right, the husband of one wife. They put a lot of emphasis on that. That's one of the qualifications. But keep reading. Vigilant, wide awake. I know a lot of pastors are dead in a hammer. Sober, of good behavior. Well, that isn't good behavior. The case he's talking about. Not in good behavior at all. Given to hospitality, apt to teach. I know a lot of pastors couldn't teach a dedication Bible school. Not given to wine, no strikers, Jack Wood. <laughs> I mean, Jack would get mad at you and slam you right in the teeth, see? I mean, see, these are ideal qualifications. You get as many as you can. Not greedy or filthy lucre. Mm, mm, mm. You talk about knocking them out. Isn't it strange how all these fellows lay the emphasis on the sex parts? And, and, and I'll admit those other parts of strange kind of civilization you live in. Let me tell you something. You can get just as crazy about money as you can in sex. There are four things ever get a hold of a guy that'll fix it. Good. One of them is sex, one of them is money, one of them liquor, and one of them drugs. And those four things, if they ever get a good hold on you, they'll get a good hold. A lot of folks can't understand why a fellow, you know, gets saved and can't give up liquor. A lot of people think a lot of these mission bums are lost because they get saved in an altar and then go right back to the bottle. Well, that doesn't only show a lack of compassion and understanding, it shows a lack of intelligence and spirituality. You have no idea how that stuff can get a hold of you to you, how to get a hold of you. 
And the same way with the drugs. I mean, I think what a fellow is saying, you ought to quit drugs. I sure do. I think a fellow gets saved, ought to quit the liquor. And I quit them and didn't have any trouble with the drugs. I was never on them. They passed around a... You know, about ahead of your time, man. The guys in my band were smoking marijuana in 39. That's before World War II. But I never took them. I never took them. I was scared of them. I mean, I get drunk. I was that dumb, you know. I was dumb enough to get drunk, and I was dumb enough to take drugs. Because I noticed it did, did crazy stuff. That the band leader would kick you off your feet, see. You play Blueberry Hill, he'd kick it off. Seven o'clock, he'd kick it off. And you play... Fought that temple, and he start smoking this pot, this little old cigarette pack, these brown wrap cigarettes, you know, they have any camel or chest on them. <laughs> he starts puffing these things, and boy, along about nine o'clock, he kick it off. By 11 o'clock, he kicked that thing off. <laughs> I mean, something going wrong with the guy's timing, you know. I watched Cooper and Cooper play Wirebrush Stomp. <laughs> you give a cut a slap, you put that fast on the floor. <laughs> I mean, for three minutes, man. Three minutes. This guy all hopped up. So I never took them. But I'll tell you, it's hard to get off liquor. It's hard to get off drugs. And the same way with the sex thing. That sex stuff to get all your pornography, you'll have a time shaking it, boy. You'll have a time shaking it. Folks, I don't believe any homosexual can be saved. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, the effeminate won't inherit it, and neither and so were some of you. 1 Corinthians 6. Some of them, folks, got saved with queer. Folks said, you ever know a queer really got saved and straightened out? No, I must confess I haven't. Because I haven't worked to a lot of queers. <laughs> and, and I don't intend to work with a lot of queers. And I will avoid all the queers I can, if possible. <laughs> because my generation didn't handle it like this generation. My generation beat the brains out. In the army, in the army... In the army, we found a faggot in the army. He he wasn't safe, man. Let's get a colonel, a captain, to pull him under the wing, boy, take care of him. Or he'd be around behind the barracks every night, get beaten the rag dolls. So I've often often thought I'd do if I you know if I got age, and maybe I wouldn't do it. But you get it anywhere these days. I sneeze in your face, and you had it, you know. But I mean, all oh, a surgeon general, man, he's dangerous to your health. <laughs> But if I ever got, if I ever got AIDS, I think I'd do this. I'd like to do this. I'd get me a wig, see, and put me some earrings, get a wig. I know where to go. I don't, I know where to go to get them, boy. I mean, I can, I can get you more faggots and more fruits, man, and 15 minutes before I go, you would in L.A. you well, it's all night. Down there in Key West, that thing is an international rendezvous for them. And the Marriott Hotel there, good old Mormons out of Salt Lake City, baby. Have a thing sitting up there with a room of 600 bucks a night. Single. 600 bucks a night. And you can't get a job at that hotel unless you can prove you're a queer. And I would get me a, I would get me a, a, a wig and some earrings. <laughs> 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 and then I'd get me, then I'd, then I'd get me a 38. I've got a, I've got a got good 9 millimeter, uh, coat now. That Austin pistol is a beauty. That is a beauty, man. I mean, 17 shots for that reloading. And, and, and get you, and get your silence in that thing. And then put, break up your gun, put it in your suitcase, and, you know, you don't catch, well, catch security, you won't have the bullet in your pocket. And I go down there Saturday night, wait well, Sunday night, about 7 o'clock, put them a wig, and get me a pocketbook, a purse with that coke in it. And then I go back in the restroom there, about 9 o'clock at night, and just wait behind the door and tumble them when they came in, brother. And I mean, I bet you could burn 50 of them things before anybody know you're in there. I just took that and just <laughs> in the hall over the corner, and the blood wouldn't make any difference. You got age anyway. You're dying anyway. I mean, who cares about that? You know, get some more and pull them over. And then work your way toward the door and pile them up, see, at one end. As soon as they come in the door, and pull them over. And then when you get the place full, <laughs> you step outside in the hallway and then shoot them in the back going through. 
And if you had any ammo left, you could work your way down the hole. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I bet you kill 50 of them things before they finally get you. And it wouldn't be able to got you anyway. By then, you've done your good deed. I mean, think of, think of think of all the people you'd save from getting AIDS by killing 50 of them faggots. Let's see, where was I here? First Timothy. First Timothy. I didn't know that was in First Timothy 3, but it showed up there. First Timothy 3, verse... First Timothy 3, verse 3. But patient, not a brawler. There you go. <laughs> Nor covetous. Look at that thing. Oh, if you took every minister out of the ministry that coveted land or money or parking lots or more members, good night, man. So it's ideal. One that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection to all gravity. What if he doesn't have any children? Carl Ackie did it. Carl Ackie and his wife, they didn't have any children. Well, he would disqualify him for he doesn't have any children. See, those things are ideal qualifications. These little Protestant popes up say, you don't qualify, you don't qualify. Chance of 10 to 1, they don't qualify. I've heard them all tell me, Ruckman doesn't qualify for the ministry. Ruckman doesn't qualify. Well, I'll, I'll go along with them. I've resigned three times. Three times, and here I am. <laughs> I wish some of them would resign just once and see if God would give the folks a blessing, you know. I've given up. I've decided the best thing to do is just go on with a disqualified ministry. That's about all you can do. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. Every, I'll tell you something, brother. Every time I've, I've, uh, every time I've resigned, the Lord has dumped an extra ministry on me. And honest to God, people, honest to God, you ask my wife, should tell honest to God, I've got such a load of me right now. I, four secretaries can't even handle the mail. Four of them. I got a church secretary, Mrs. Mitchell, and a school secretary, or two school secretaries, Mrs. Mitchell and Mrs. Brown, and who's church secretary? Maureen. And then Maureen, and then myself answering mail, and you can't handle it. You can't handle the stuff. I mean, the first time I said it didn't qualify, the Lord gave me a church and a school. And the next time I said it didn't qualify, the Lord gave me a track ministry and a book ministry. And the next time I said it didn't qualify, I got 20 Nigerian pastors and 30 Filipino pastors sending me material and writing back the whole time and sending them equipment for people over there. They got a King James coat in, in Minnesota now giving those BBF fellows a fit over there. Just giving them a fit. And Nigerian pastors, then a prison ministry, then the missionaries, and then here comes this television thing. 35 stations, man. I just... I haven't got time to go fishing to play racquetball or nothing anymore, man. It's getting bad. <laughs> By this amount of qualification. Now, now, here's the thing about this case he's talking about. Number one, we can say this. We can say the fellow could be forgiven on an individual basis. Certainly God will forgive him, and the brethren ought to forgive him. All right, forgive us and cover. Now, the question is about the ministry. Well, let not your good deal spoken of. And it is going to be. And uh, charity behave itself not unseemly. And while the world stands, I'll do nothing to cause my brother to stumble or offend or make him fall. And the problem that you have with a thing like that where a pastor gets in a mess like that is it causes such a reproach and such a scandal and such talk that it ruins the thing for hundreds and hundreds of people. And in a case like that, the advice I'd give would be this. I give in a case like that, I would say the thing for the fellow to do is, first of all, of course, to repent and get right and judge it and confess it and make things as right as he could and then get out of the work and go someplace else. And if he still felt called to ministry, start a work someplace else. And I certainly wouldn't start it within a hundred miles of where I was. Now, this is a big country. And if a man messes up in one place, there isn't any point of him standing there and just keeping the the, 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 the mess, the broth stirred. There are all kinds of places you could go. I would move a minimum of 500 miles off and, and go on if it was possible. If it was possible. And sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes when the fellow does that, the Lord will put him out. But it's the Lord that puts a man in the ministry and it's the Lord that puts him out of the ministry. When Paul talks about being a castaway over there in First Corinthians chapter 9, the Lord is going to do that. 
For this cause, many among you are sickly, and many are weak, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chasing the Lord. The Lord does the work. So that's what I'd say in a situation like that, brother. That's all I could say. The Lord put the in, the Lord put the He's out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure he is. You can't tell the Lord what to do. Some of them, some of them will try it. And I'll give you one example. Here I'm up. I go to a place called, uh, I forget the guy's name. He's a Tennessee Temple graduate up in uh, Birmingham. Got a good work. Good boy loves the Lord. Believe the book. And he had been for me a couple years back and somebody from Mid-South, some professor over there. Professors don't like me. They don't like me. I'm a bad boy. And that professor, and that professor phoned that, uh, you know, ain't my fault. Ain't my fault. I didn't tend to get to be educated. I don't care nothing about it. I mean, Lord, made me stay in and work. I don't care nothing about books. I don't like books. But I've just had to read them all my life. The Lord just shoved me in it, and here I am. i got to do the best I can. And this professor phoned this pastor up and says, I hear you're having Ruckman in for a meeting. He said, yes, I am. He said, I didn't. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. And the fellow said, well, uh, he does a good job, and our people are always blessed, get revived when he comes in, so we're having him in. And he said, well, I didn't know you'd have an adult here in your pulpit. And this kid said, uh, oh, yeah, we have him here all the time. <laughs> and that professor said, and that professor said, wow, I'm surprised, brother so-and-so. You mean to tell me you have an adult here in your pulpit? He said, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm an adult here myself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that professor liked to swallow his teeth, and he said, he said, what, 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 I thought you only been married once. He said, I have been only married once. But you know, the Lord said, whoever looks upon a woman the lust out of his heart hath all with it. Click. You know what that is? You know what that is? That's a Pharisee trying to put on a show. Question back there in the back. Yes, sir. No, not, brother, you've had three chances. This fellow hadn't had one yet. Uh-huh. All right, so uh, let's turn to Genesis 49. This is where we get out. You know, we get out in the twilight zone them here. Genesis, uh, Genesis 49 and Zephaniah chapter 2. And a lot of what I'm going to say now, I'm going to be guessing at, because these things aren't nailed right down. But there's something here. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you, you can be sure of, Zephaniah. I said Zephaniah 2, make it Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah 3. The first thing you can be sure of, the next thing isn't so sure. Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah 3, verse 8. Now, everybody, this thing is supposed to be taken by by surprise, and it comes from America being so brainwashed the news media, they've lost all sense of what's going on. Now, now you tell them Ruckman said this, and they can cuss me out for it. What you're seeing right now is the greatest communist uprising in the world. Communism teaches the people. The people, the people. You know, rising up in Russia, the people. You know what Marx taught? The people should overthrow the overthrow the establishment. You know what's going on? It's going on in Russia. Now the Chinese people tried it. They tried it about two or three months ago. It didn't work. It's a student movement. Communism is a student journalist movement to overthrow the establishment. The trouble is, we keep thinking when they rise up, that's democracy. Now let me tell you something, folks. Now that you all lost your brain watching the boob tube, this country was not, are you listening? This being taped? Good. It being taped back there? Anywhere? Okay, good. All right, just make 20,000 copies of it. This country, this country was not set up as a democracy. It was set up as a republic. You understand? And long about 1860, when the Civil War broke out, they said to Lincoln, what are you doing attacking these people for doing what we did to England back in 1776? And Abraham Lincoln puffed up and said, well, unity is more important than the Constitution. Because the Union was here before the Constitution was here. Therefore, it's all right to violate the Constitution to maintain the Union. That was his position. He violated it three times. First of all, compulsory, mil compulsory military draft. Nobody voted on it. Income taxes. Nobody voted on it. And then set a gunboat down the Chesapeake Bay with ammunition for Fort Sumner disguised as a merchant marine. Three shots. Now, you're not going to get that in 
high school, public high schools, because it's all headed toward the communist democratic form. But that's the end of your republic. Folks talk about the battle hymn of the republic. That ain't no republic they're setting up. And let me tell you something, you Yankees, Boy, unless you think I'm trying to start a civil war. When that war ended, you lost your country, too. You know who owns all the property in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and California, and, and Montana, and Arizona? Washington, D.C. You don't believe it? Just don't pay your taxes and watch who takes your property. The federal bureaucrats of Washington, D.C. Let me, let me ask you, are there, any, are there any forts around here? Any military installations? What do you got? What else? All right, we'll take Long Beach Naval Base, we'll take MacArthur. All right, here's California. Suppose you folks decide to get together and secede from the Union. You say, why? Because you're an independent state, you believe in democracy, don't you? Hey, aren't you trying to tell those folks in Lithuania right now to leave the Soviet Republic? Aren't you behind that? What is this double standard? Where America says, get out, boy, get out, hooray, da, 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 and all out the free, and then when you try to get out, kill them. Ain't that a peculiar thing? And there's Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Mississippi saying, we don't want to belong to that Soviet Union, we're going to get out. You rebels, kill them. 200,000 casualties. And right now, Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia and Poland and Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria are crying you over here beating the drum for them. Isn't that a strange thing? Well, let me tell you something. If California wanted to get out, whose land is out up there where MacArthur is and the, and the naval base? Why, it's California's. Isn't that ground in California, or are my eyes deceiving me looking at a map? <laughs> Does that land belong in Maryland? That's where it belongs. And if you secede from the Union, the government troops at MacArthur and San Diego will start firing on the populace before war broke out. You know what that means? I mean, California is not a free, independent, sovereign state as your founding father set you up. It's part of the federal Soviet. You know that happened? That happened in 1865. All right, it's a democracy. Zephaniah 3.8. And democracy is not a republic. Zephaniah 3.8. Now, this is the Lord talking. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day... But I rise up to the prey, second advent. Now, here we go. My determination. Now, God said he's going to do this. He determined to do it. And boy, when the Lord gets determined to do something, who in the world is going to stop it? Can, can you imagine a being that could make the sun, make it in his mind to do something, and then you get in the way? <laughs> I mean, what a thing, man. I mean, the Lord makes a solar furnace where the degrees are hotter than 8,000 degrees, and you can't even look at it without going blind, and then he says, I'm going to do something. And what are you going to do to stop it? My determination, watch it, watch this, is to gather the nations. they got to get together. Gather them, what? United Nations. Gather the nations. That I may assemble the kingdoms. United Nations Assembly is what they call it. Why? To pour upon the mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured the fire of my jealousy. God's purpose is to get all these folks together in one bundle. What for? To burn them. Amen, brother. I mean, I know that's awful negative, but that's the purpose. Now, you know where that purpose is found? Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about this thing, and he said, Let both grow together till the harvest, and the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, Gather ye first together the tares and bind them in bundles. That'll take place before the wheat goes into the barn. Before the wheat goes into the barn, the tares are gathered together in bundles to burn them. So you've got to get them together. All right, now they're getting together. Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. Now, here's a, I'll try to call Europe. I don't have the back here to draw by. Well, I have to draw from memory the best flyer I memorized from the last time I was up at a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed to me it was kind of like this, you know. 
Cops come down here and I'll be Don't fall through them. Bring the cops up here. Where the road is. Or I'll see them here. Someone's going to come here and I'll go over here. Now right here, uh, is the Alpha High Box. <laughs> <laughs> right here, you know, the Alpha High Box. Right here, you know, the Alpha High Box. And that place is sitting there like that, and that is a strange place in there. I think it's not as big as Texas. And that thing is called Joyce Lock. Joyce Lock. They have all kinds of things where they think that thing comes from. They have all kinds of, you can trace the derivation of that word and where it comes from, and the D being a T, and Toich, and running that thing down. And then German, they get the thing down, and the root they get is a war man. A war man, when they get down the bottom of that thing. I think you're sitting there in Central Europe. Central Europe. That is, that is a European. Jason is German. I put J that's what Jason is German. And you know what? If you get over there, you go in a place like a Hoffman house and sit there, and I have, and been over there four, four times now, or five times, I think four times. And I'd go over again if I could go. I'd go tonight if I could go. And you get over there, and they get all, you know, having a big time. I have to be careful over there. I have to be real careful. Because if it's in your blood, it, it tends to walk off with you. And they get singing, you know, I'm on some street, kind of off dry house, I'm, I'm, you know, they, and when you get at a table, nobody introduces anybody to anybody. You get at a table and sit down, and everybody sits there and just begin to talk. Nobody ever introduces themselves. When they get singing, you all join hands. You know, start going. And you get in there, and that thing, I can't, I can't, I can't tell that one. That's a good one. But anyway, anyway, it's characteristic of those people. Germans by themselves are great folks. A German by himself is usually a loyal father and a good husband and a good provider and a hard worker. Absolutely. And duty first and, I mean, thorough and, and, and reliable. But when they get together, the bad news. When they get in a mob, they get a, some kind of a spirit. I don't know what it is, but I know it because I feel it when I'm in there. And they get going like that, and every now and then, uh, Camino tell, tell a joke or something, they'll laugh in the kind of quiet place, and all of a sudden that crowd will go, oh, like that. Or, oh, like that. Or, and no signal. 500 people now. Oh, like that. And you look around there, and you know what you see? You see faces like mine. Some of them are round, they're round, they like, uh, like them, you know, some are round like that. Those are Slavs, they're, they're Magyars, they come in from Austria, Central Europe. You look around there, you see some face like this, and they got this, they got this face like this. Oh, those are Slavs, and you see face there that are, that are long like this. And the double jaw. And those are Prussians. And you see blonde and brunette. They you say, well, the Germans are blonde. No, the encyclopedia said the average German has red brown hair. Now, what you got in there is Central Europe. Those things are, that's the epitome of your Frenchman, Norwegian, Swede, Denmark, British, your Anglo Saxon. Listen, Anglo Saxon. Saxony isn't any, it's in Germany. That's Central Germany. That's where you came from if you're English. Anglo-Saxon. Now that thing is, there's a, there's a milling pot in there. And those folks are together in there, and they are the, they are Europe compressed right in there. That's a hot spot. You take a line from Greenwich and run it right down to where your first fall Christian is, and it goes right through there. And it goes right through Vienna. And it goes right by Berlin. And it goes right through Martin Luther. And on that line is Beethoven, Brahms, Schumann, Mendelssohn, Wagner, Schubert, Karl Marx, Einstein, the Bilderbergers, the House of Rothschild, the International Bankers, the Illuminati, right on that line. Through there. So when you're talking about this thing taking place in Europe, you have a thing here that this thing was divided, and now it's united. And once it gets united, Europe begins to mop the sweat off their brow. Because that place over there, that place, whenever those folks get together, now, see, Germans by themselves are great folks. <laughs> but you get them together, 
And this, boom, bam, boom, and away we go, man. So they're scared to death. Now, I'll tell you a strange thing about their money. If any man can receive his mark, Now, that's a German measure of money. It's called a mark. That's what that thing is called. That's a strange thing. Now, another strange thing. Out of that country comes a German Jew. And his name is Karl Marx. Those Russians haven't been professing to follow a Russian. They've been professing to follow a German. And you start thinking about the influence of that country. Red China got all it knows from Germany. Red China. I mean, they'll say, come, man, he's a Marxist. Martin Luther King Jr. said, as far as economics is concerned, I am a Marxist. That stuff. If a man is a communist or Marxist, he got it from Germany. He got it from right there. And when you get over there, you sense that thing. Now, I, I can't talk German good enough to really sit down and deal with them. Now, I have a good time over there. I don't have to, I've been in a place where nobody spoke English for two and three days, and so I don't have any trouble. Uh, but I can ask directions. Turn to me, turn to me, go to Bahnhof this. Uh, you know, which way is someplace, Belchus Beg, from Bahnhof, which way is to here? And, uh, how many I similar to knock? Do you have a, I can get along. And when you come to a place, you say, come, uh, ye man here speak English? Anybody here speak English? And they always shake their heads. Oh, no. And I'll start, and I'll say, uh, and Schuligan Have, uh, forgive me. Ich bin ein Amerikaner, und mein Deutsch sprach ist nicht sehr gut, ist sehr, ist sehr schlecht. My speaking is very good. Bitte haben Geduld mit mir, have patience with me, and they begin to laugh. And then they all begin to talk English. They all know English. <laughs> you, are, you won't fool them people? You won't fool them people, boy? You get up early in the morning to fool them people. I mean, you get over there, and last time I was over, they gave an Audi. It had five cylinders. It had five cylinders. That thing would go from 60 to 90 between about here and the end of that court. I'm just like taking off on a five cylinders, man, 20 miles to the gallon. You get over there, and you drive along there, and your right away is in your left window. You say, why? Because you can see out of the window. These stupid Americans, the, the guy on your right has the right away, and you can't see him. If you think about that, you look across at the pastor between you and him. Then there's a visor, or there may be a rearview mirror, or a, a bracket on the car. Why would the guy have the right of way on you, the fellow that could hit you, that you've got to see when you're blocked, when all you have to look out this window and see him over here? See, the Americans can't think. There's something wrong with their mind going on. <laughs> well, I, I was, I, I, over there, been on commodes over there where they flush by leaning this, leaning back in the seat. You know, you know what a lot of them have? They have a plunger that's made out of galvanized iron. <laughs> I'm afraid so, brother. <laughs> but I, but I'm leading up to something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get this brother's thing here in a minute. <laughs> now, to get this, you get this galvanized iron pipe in this commode, and it is gonna rust galvanized iron, so it's going to last 10 or 15 years, and it does have a little chain, and then a little rubber, and a little sinker, and a little wire, and where you break the wire, and the chain goes off, and the rubber tears, and when you flush, you can flush all the way, or halfway, or quarter of the way. It's got a wooden hand on the top, you pull it up as far as you want and drop it. You'd think a fellow could figure that out. Instead of the chain here, click, clank, click, clank, this clips here, that thing drops off there. Why, they had those plastic grocery bags over there 15 years ago. Plastic grocery bags. You're just getting over here in the last couple of years. You use the same bag over and over again. Over there, windows like this. It's on a, it's on a, on a, on an axle like that. When you go to bed at night, you tip the window like that. You've got three inches at the top and three inches at the bottom automatically. Or a foot at the top and a foot at the bottom automatically. So what about the flies? I never saw a fly in four trips over there except at Holiday Inn. <laughs> American Holiday Inn had them. But you find them at McDonald's over there. But the whole place I stayed around Beckett's Garden, over Armagall and Mittenwald and Garnish part of Kirken, there weren't any flies there. Now that country has got something, there's some kind of an intent or something in there that gets a hold of them. I tell the Germans, uh, America is nicht mehr an Adler, America is ein Hirn. 
America is no longer an eagle, it's a hen. And they laugh. They laugh. And I get in with them. I get in with them. I get in with them quick, man. And they tell me, one of them grabbed me one time, they said, listen, you Americans got to help us against these Russians. <laughs> that was ten years ago. That guy was living 40 miles from the Russian zone, and he's ready to fight. And you're sitting over here 9,000 miles away, shaking in your boots. It's amazing. All right, now they're over there, they're getting together. Now what's going to happen? All right, Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. One more shot here, and then I'll try to get it together. Genesis 49:27. Now, Genesis 49, uh, 49, 27, there's a man called Benjamin. And then Whittemar is broken. I know there's 12 tribes that come in this And I know in the book of in the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 32, it says, when the most tribes divided the nation, they gave their heads, he separated the sons of from the man, he divides them according to the number of the children of Israel. So, but it has to be somewhere on this earth, twelve nations that match those twelve tribes. Now, you get along here, and then Garan's calling comes in on you, the British Israelites come on you. Ephraim is a bit of you start there. Now, listen, everywhere you find there's a lie, there's a truth behind it somewhere. So, there's some truth in there somebody hasn't got. I don't profess to have had it. I've tried many times, uh, many, many times. I've laid them out by list, 12, 12, and 12. There's, uh, there's all 12 of them laid out there in a tenth attic with the things I have them, trying to line them up, trying to line up them 12s. And I, there's an attempt at it. There's an attempt to line up the 12 notes for the 12 colors, for the 12 months, for the 12 tribes, for the 12 nations. Because they're going to match. God got a thing. Matter of fact, I got twelve fruit for the tree of life sitting off off here, and try to get the twelve major fruits and match them with the months. I haven't got it, but I still worked at it. Matter of fact, over here I went to twelve kinds of fish, and twelve kinds of domesticated animals, and twelve kinds of wild animals. I haven't got it yet. I've been working at it, you know, thirty thirty three years, so I don't guess I'll get it fixed in the next couple of years. <laughs> But there, there's something there. There's something there. Now, I'm not going to talk about anybody but this one right here. And the rest of them, I don't know much about. I might be wrong on this one. But looky here. 49.27. Ben Yamin, son of my right hand. That's what uh, uh, Jacob called him. His mother calls him... Ben Ami, son of my sorrow, when he's born. His mother dies when he's born. Benjamin, he's the younger brother. Benjamin shall ravine or raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now, the strange thing about that boy Benjamin is one of his parents says, You're the best man I got, you're my right hand man. Other parents say, You caused me a lot of sorrow. Now, there are two men in the Bible from that tribe, and you know both men. And one of those men in that Bible is one of the greatest types of Antichrist in the whole Bible. And that's going to bring us on our subject here in a minute. And the other man in the Bible is the greatest Christian that ever lived. And they're both from the same tribe. And they both have the same name. Isn't that a peculiar thing? One of them is Saul, uh, and he's the Old Testament. One of the types of Antichrist persecuted today, the other one is Saul of Tarsus. Now, there's the, one of the best men in the Bible, one of the worst men in the Bible. I'll tell you something funny about Germany. Germany produced the greatest type of Antichrist that ever lived. The greatest Jew killer type Antichrist that ever lived on this earth, Germany produced. And it produced the greatest Christian the world ever seen since Paul, the man that caused the Protestant Reformation to bust loose from the same country. Now I'll show you something else to do. The first Bible translated into a modern European language is found by family by a dog, or a dog, <laughs> not a dog. And his name is Euphilus. And he translates his Bible about oh about uh, 340 AD. You know what that name means? Little Wolf. That's a German. That's the first Germanic language. 
You know what that book matches? It matches your King James 1611. It doesn't match the Alexandrian text. You'll find this as Gothic text, G-O-T-H-I-C, matches your King James text. You know what this word means, too? From which you took this? It means noble wolf. Noble wolf. Now that's a strange thing. You know the other thing strange about it? That little old tribe of Benjamin took on the other eleven tribes two times. Two times. Took on the whole world twice. And they finally beat him. I mean, they whipped Benjamin down enough and killed him down about 400 people and had to get wise. So they whipped him. But old Benjamin took him on. Took him on. All right, now. Trying to get this stuff together. I just could be talking now. So I'm not telling what I got. <laughs> uh, here's a quote sitting down here. You know what I thought about Spain? That's always been here and always will be. That's why it's a fifth rate world power. That's my hill thing. I mean, folks, you realize in California, surely in California, in California, you realize who should run the world. Spain should run the world. These Spain's not located. Spain has better coastline than England. Even for centuries, you couldn't even ship out in there. That place is frozen over in the winter. You see, Spain, it's got access to the Mediterranean. England doesn't. That's why it had to get the Straits of Gibraltar. You see, Spain is just down here and get in the Orient, and England has to say, well, carry on to keep a good hold. You see, Spain it has access to the New World and a tropic, and the South, a semi, semi tropic climate. That's the country should have run over. Not the country that killed the Jews and drove out the Christians and burned the Bibles and got drunk their arm bottom and bottom the English Channel in 1588. That was the end of it. In France, the Pope don't have to worry about France. They've always been Catholic. They always will be Catholic. They don't have to worry about Belgium. Catholic. But the Pope don't have to worry about South Island. Catholic. Always has been Catholic. Always will be Catholic. The Pope don't have to worry about Italy. Has been Catholic. Always has been Catholic. Always will be Catholic. Who can worry about Poland? Always a 98% Catholic. Now it's 99% Catholic. That's where the two largest killing camps in the war were put up, Treblinka and Auschwitz. And Treblinka, the commandant of Treblinka, is Franz Stangl. And Franz Stangl is a baptized, confirmed Christian Roman Catholic. Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess, confirmed, baptized, Christian Roman Catholic. Right. You're not going to get that in the Holocaust, and I'm going to tell you. I never thought about all that. Austria, 100% Roman Catholic. Solid cover to cover. Here's what the Pope can't get a hold of. This thing here. That was Lutheran, and that whole thing there is Greek Orthodox. And when they killed the Tsar and ran him out and the Communists took over, they wiped out a lot of Greek Orthodox churches. Well, I know the Greek Orthodox churches all wiped out the whole place slapped all the pieces. Now, Gorbachev gets because the Pope, and the Pope says, you've got to have religious liberty. You've got to have religious liberty. Meaning what? Liberty for the Roman Catholic Church. Three times the Pope has tried to come down to the Greek Orthodox country to get to Jerusalem. Three times. One time in 1914. My, there's so much. There's so much. There's so much. 1914, where old Princip stepped up on the carriage of Franz Ferdinand, the nephew of Franz Joseph, and blew his brains out and his wife's brains out, and started World War II. That thing took place, that thing took place right there. Third Ivo by Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, right in there. Now, the Austrian ambassador, Bert Kohl, blew the thing all the pieces. My dad went over and, oh, you know, 14 million casualties, all hell broke loose. That's a Roman Catholic job. The Roman Catholic Church trying to get this area down in here and get the big Orthodox Church. I'll tell you another time it is. There's the Crusades. They sent the Crusaders right down through there, right down there, to get the boat down there. And the third time they tried it, Adolf Hitler, right down through Yugoslavia, right down and on the Greece, and the Pope can get over there and get, folks, oh, you know your Bible. Go show the man of sin going to wind up. He's going to wind up in the temple showing himself that he's God. Second Thessalonians 2. That rascal's got to get from there down through there. Our way to get down through there now is through Yugoslavia and Bulgaria and Romania and Greece. And the way to get there is to line up with Russia 
And the way Russia can help him out is to take the brains and the stuff off for a while, loosen things up, and give liberty to get him down there and get that place going. What the Pope will have eventually is Roman Catholicism from there to there. And up in here, it ain't going to make too much difference, but they're that Lutheran, and the average Swedish Lutheran is just like a Roman Catholic. And the socialistic state doesn't matter what And about all he won't have is England and Scotland. And right now he's got the Archbishop of Canterbury, Brother Runcie, under his thumb, just like that, and they're going to push him down. So he has this. About all the Pope will have is North Ireland and Scotland. And he'll probably get them murdered by the 20,000. If you get the British Army out of Ireland, he'll get them murdered, and he'll have that too. Now, if you're, how many of you are Scotch ancestors? Let me see your hand. Scotch. You people, you people are the only people going to survive out of Europe that hate the Pope to the very end and never yielded. And your people still parade in Belfast and Edinburgh on William of Orange Day and saying, it's up the tall ladder and down the short rope and three cheers for Queen Mary and uh, with the Pope. <laughs> That's what they're saying. And the Scotch people have never submitted to the Roman Catholic Pope. And they're one of the few peoples that fought against the Catholics with muskets and swords. They didn't yield. They didn't turn the other cheek. That's your Scotch covenant. They got back and shot back at them and fought against them. But outside that, the Pope will have the whole thing. Now, Germany. Germany is the place. All right? All the Rhineland is Roman Catholic. All Bavaria is Roman Catholic. The only part that wasn't Roman Catholic was East Germany. It was Prussian and Protestant. And now the East Germans have come across the West German like this, and somebody's going to have the final say-so in what's set up. It'll be the West Germans, or it's over. They'll set up their economic system, and with them will come their religion, and Germany will once again become Roman Catholic like it was before Lutheran Reformation. And the Pope will have the whole thing. Somebody has the whole thing, then... All these nations here will be anti-Semitic because the Pope is anti-Semitic. Good people, do you know the Pope hasn't even recognized Israel as a state yet? And that all these folks here be winning, now if you get the United States with him, then you'll have the whole world. And boy, listen, when you see Japan, China, Europe, and America lining up against Israel, you can know it's all over. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Boy, I'll tell you, the final stage is being set, boy. It's being set. And it's going to be Roman Papa Uberalis. <laughs> Zechariah 14.1. You know, you know how Israel's going to be left at the end of the tribulation of the beginning? They're going to be left with the entire world against them. The whole world. The whole world. And God's going to do that to show his power. God's going to say, I'll show you something. And he'll line them up where the odds against them are about uh, something like uh, 500,000 to 1, and he's going to wipe out the nations. Zechariah 14.1. The day of the Lord cometh, my spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Three. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So what's happening in Eastern Europe, I'd say, in answer to the question, is God is getting all the nations together to bring them under the dominion of the Roman Catholic Pope and the United Nations to line them up against Israel. That's what's going on. All right, one more. Yes, sir. All right. Now, here's the problem with that thing. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 24. The problem with that thing about is, is, the, is there may be an interval or may not be an interval. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 in one hand and 1 Thessalonians 4 in the other. Now, we take for granted the tribulation will start as soon as the Christians are caught out. But when we take that for granted, we're taking a little bit too much for granted. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 24. Well, now, there's one thing for sure. In Matthew 24, we're going to be cut out before this takes place, because if this took place, then you could lose your salvation. That's that thing, see. 
All those verses talking about losing your salvation, losing your salvation are there, but they don't apply to you. But they must apply to somebody, because look at verse 13, Matthew 24, 13. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. That isn't for you. How do you know? This gospel of the kingdom, that isn't your gospel, shall be preached in all the world for a witness. 15, the holy place, that isn't you. 16, Judea, that isn't you. Verse 20, that your flight be on the, that isn't you. That's the tribulation. Notice a different gospel and a different way of folks getting saved in those days. So there's one thing for sure, that thing can't take place till you're caught out. All right, now, First Thessalonians chapter 4, in Paul's day, Paul's expecting to be caught out at any time. Look at verse, uh, verse 15. If he's expecting to be caught out at any time, then there must there be a long gap between them and the tribulation if the tribulation didn't start right then. First Thessalonians 4.15, this way say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, see that first person? We, that's Paul, we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. 15, that we which are alive, we, verse 15, so shall we, he's talking about himself. He's expecting Christ to come way back in there. So we don't know what this interval is. All we know is this. We know there's a time up here sometime for a seven year period takes place that hasn't taken place yet. And we know sometime before that thing takes place, we're going to get caught out. Now we take the granted that we're going to get caught out here and from the start as soon as we're caught out. But that can't be proved in the scripture. There may be a gap in there of one year, two years, three years, four years. There might have been a gap of 50 years, 100 years. We don't know what that gap was. You don't know what it is right now. On the way of figuring these things, there are seven ways to figure for that uh, rapture, and every way you figure the rapture, the date you get is 1989. That's the And you heard me say, it's just the time on tapes, if our calendar is right, if our calendar is right, I always put that qualifying statement in. Always. If our count is right, then the rapture cannot be any later. I never say earlier, because it could have been in fall day. Any earlier than 1989. Oh, I just found 1990. What'd you do, miss the rapture? <laughs> I mean, Ruckman's a date setter, a false prophet and prophesied. No, I said, if our count is right, if our count is right, evidently our count is not right. I, I figured that on this date, Christ being born four BC. I've got, well, I've got the advent of 2008. Now, that date is pretty fixed. If our calendar is right. <laughs> Subtract four BCs for the birth of Christ, you've got an advent date of 1996. Subtract seven years of tribulation, you've got a rapture date of 1989. So if Christ is born four BC, here's Scorpio Bible says he is, and all the chronologists say he is born four BC, the rapture could have been May last year. But it wasn't born 4 B.C. It must have been 3 B.C. If it's 3 B.C., hang on to your hats, you got about two months to go. Yeah. If it's 3 B.C., you're up in here. But that might be wrong. Maybe it was 2 B.C. In which case, you'd have to wait a little longer. However, if it was born in uh, 1 B.C., you're up in here. And if the dates are just right to where they are, then the advent is in 2000 BC, and seven years would make the rapture in 1993. So it's all a question of what the calendar is. And folks say, what and what the calendar is? No, I don't want no chronology. I don't know what it is. I just know if the calendar is right, those are the dates. And if well those that part of the calendar is right, I don't know. I haven't got any idea. But those are the dates. Now I'm going to say two things before we close. It can't be much beyond that, even if the whole thing is wrong. If all the calendar is wrong, you can't run more than four years, no matter what you do, without running right into the mark of the beast. Because the thing is all set up. The computer is set up. You folks have been taking the number of the beast now for almost ten years. And you buy that stuff down at the grocery store, that's a six. And that's a six in the middle. And that's a six on the end. You've been buying 666 six, six for 10 years. 
Oh, that's got the man who's sitting now taking over Europe and getting the whole thing. You got the computer system set up. You got the thing all laid together. She's ready to go. She's ready to go. Now, as what the Antichrist has to do with Germany, I don't know. I've thought that the Antichrist would be a Syrian Jew. And I believe that. A Syrian Jew. But he could come out of Germany. He could come out of Germany. The nearest thing to it right now is the, the emperor, the, the heir to the Habsburg throne. Right now, somewhere over there in Europe, there's a guy who claims that he's a monarch that could be on the throne of the Holy Roman Empire, and he's a Habsburg out of Austria. And he'd be a, he'd be a crowd. Of course, that's an Austrian. An Austrian is a genuine crowd. An Austrian is a German three-quarter kind. In Germany, they say, Russia, they say the situation is serious but not hopeless. In Austria, they say the situation is hopeless but not serious. Or oh, now, it's one of those dates right there. Now, before we close, I want to show you one thing that one of my students put on me about two weeks ago. He said, well, you still got the right date. And I said, well, I don't have the right date. I guessed May of last year. And I said, just a guess, but I missed my guess. He said, no. He said, you told us we're all the government in September. I said, that's right. He said, okay, we're coming to September 1996. I said, well, that's I had figured. And they said, well, it's like December of uh, 1996, and even seven years, then you'd have the rapture in September of 1989. But he said, you've been teaching us it's May of 1989. And I said, yeah. They said, well, that would be six months here too early. And they said, uh, they said six months took place and this boy, you pick up that book of Acts, and that thing is that thing is tough in there. I mean, there's a place in there where there's some time, some time, there's some time between Pentecost and the book of Acts and Acts chapter seven, where Stephen looks up and the Lord doesn't come down. If six months of Daniel's seventy week took place in here, then you've got to do something else. That took place there. Daniel's week is only six and one half years long. And if it's six and a half years long, it begins in May of 1990. And it runs a half year to September 1991. And then runs six years. Is that right? Seven years, six years. Is that right? There you go. Seven years, six years. That's it. Nine ninety six. That gives you this day. Which is the day I gave him a start with. So this kid says, You've been teaching that. Don't, don't change your teaching. Keep your teaching the way it is. If six months took place, then you got a rapture here in 1990. And six and a half years beginning then, the end of the same date you had over there. So I haven't given up hope yet. <laughs> In fact, I'll be looking for the Lord real strong to this May, along about Pentecost. About Pentecost. And if he doesn't come, okay, there's something wrong with the calendar. Ain't nothing wrong with me, man. I mean, I'm fun. I'm ready for him to come anytime. I, if, 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 if he comes right now, he's going to break my heart. If he comes right now, I'm going to get up there and say, why didn't you wait till the day I prophesied? <laughs> the dumb, stupid thing, man. I mean, I, all I want to do is come back. But I'll tell you this right now, with that mess over in Europe heading up there and Gorbachev and that poop coming in and those countries all going Roman Catholic, you're getting into a situation where it can't go more than three years whether the counter's right or wrong. Because you're going to step into a period of time where a different gospel is being preached. And Paul said, if any man preach on the gospel, let God curse him. Why, folks, in the tribulation, not... That angel preaching that everlasting gospel is not preaching the gospel of the grace of God at all. That isn't for you. All right, brother, I'll be enough. You better come ahead. We're after 12 now. I've been pretty patient with it. Well, you won't get that stuff anywhere else. That's for sure. I, I like to say this publicly. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Ruckman. I always have. Um, I guess the reason I, I like him and I, I want to be identified with him is because.